The tech world is at a bit of a crossroads. You see, on one side, we have tech doing amazing, exciting, even life-changing things like connecting us with loved ones from across the globe, predicting life-threatening illnesses before doctors, creating rockets that can land themselves, cars that can drive themselves. The list goes on. But on the other side, we've seen tech negatively impact societies influence governments, wrongly discriminate against people, and every year more innovations appear. They get bigger, they get better and more impactful, both for good and for bad. Digital ethics to me is about thinking about what we do with technology and the moral outcomes. You know, for example, there are lots of artificial intelligence use cases but just because we can, should we? That voice is Dave Strong. My name is Dave Strong. I'm the pre-sales director for Hybrid IT here at HPE. Along with Dave and today's guests, we're exploring digital ethics, the tech topic at the centre of everything we do as organisations. That asks, whose responsibility is it to protect users from the negative consequences of tech? Where can organisations turn to for guidance in this brave new data-driven world? And how on earth can we mitigate risks for technologies that haven't even been invented yet? All that and loads more. I'm Michael Bird, and this is Technology Untangled. Digital ethics is a field of study that looks at how technology is shaping and will shape our political, social and moral existence. Over the last three years, we've seen a real explosion in emerging technologies such as artificial intelligence and the amount of data that's out there and what we're doing with data to bring insight. Now, normally on Technology Untangled, we'd kick off with a little bit of history. But the story of ethics is, at its core, the story of innovation itself. From the internet, the smartphone and social media, to AI, automation and data analytics. If we wind all the way back and we look at the rise of of the internet, actually the internet has come from a defense background. It's come from a government background. And in the Cold War, that type of technology was used to control nuclear weapons and and to also model what would happen in, in a nuclear war. And as we roll forward then to today, we see the explosion of social media and how we interact I think from a digital ethics perspective, we need to be thinking about how much data we're giving away. I click, I like the application, I download it, I click it, I use it. Rarely do I think about actually, what have I just signed up to the data that I've just given away? Because we're living in that type of very immediate consumption-driven culture, we forget about that to a certain extent. And now as we roll forward and we've seen artificial intelligence and the technology accelerate at such a pace. And there's lots of quotes that go out said that, that the pace of change has never been so quick and it will never be this slow again. And I think now is the right time for us to really think as organizations to what we should do. Technology is absolutely everywhere in our lives. And so it- the impacts are greater as well as our relationship to it and our understanding of it is greater. That is Jen Rodfold. I'm Jen Rodfold. I am the head of digital ethics and tech for good at Sopristeria. Now for Jen, it's no surprise that we're hearing more and more about the ethics of technology right now. There are quite a few reasons that we're seeing uh, a bigger focus right now. And, and we absolutely are. It's We've been watching this in my practice over the last two years, seeing the focus grow and the attention grow on the ethical um, consequences of digital technology. I mean, for four or five years, maybe a little bit more, there's been a lot of talk and academic research around particularly um, ethics of AI And that for most of us seems probably abstract and too far in the future to worry about in our day-to-day lives. 
But what's happened, I think, since really 2016 and then more in 2018 is we've seen some really bad examples play out in public. Ah, yes. 2016 to 2018. Now, let's cast our mind back to some of their best bits. In May 2017, it was revealed that a flawed algorithm may have led the UK government to wrongly deport millions of people. In September 2017, Facebook was accused of silencing reports of ethnic cleansing in Myanmar. In March 2018, a self-driving Uber car killed a pedestrian in Arizona. Google is facing a mutiny from staff. In April 2018, Google employees strike against the company's involvement in the US government's Project Maven, also known as the Algorithmic Warfare Cross-Function Team. Facial recognition software. In July 2018, the ACLU demonstrated that Amazon's facial recognition used by local law enforcement could misidentify 28 sitting members of Congress as criminals. In September 2018, a security breach exposes 50 million Facebook users' data. And who could forget the biggest of them all? I remember I was on my way to a customer meeting in London, and I walked past this building, and there were a load of press outside. And later on in the day, I was, I was watching the news, and I realised I'd walked past the Cambridge Analytica headquarters in London. Cambridge Analytica, the scandal that frankly shocked the world. Although perhaps in hindsight, we should have seen it coming. They had harvested over 87 million Facebook users' account through an external app. And they came from a personality quiz, which I, I thought outstanded me. But that type of data harvesting wasn't new. And Obama had been a pioneer in his campaigns have been a camp, uh, pioneer of using data uh, and targeted data to give different messages to individuals. I just think Cambridge Analytica took it one step too far. They took data that people didn't know was being harvested and manipulated it to a point where we contradictory information was given. For me, that's an ethical use of data at its highest. And what amazed me and humbled me almost was the ease at which it was done and to the high profile political activities that were associated and and the, the platforms that were associated with it as well and i think that for me personally made me really reflect as as a person in the technology industry with influence to really think about everything that I do and everything we move forward with to make sure that we are protecting the ethical side of data and it has to be at the centre and at the heart of everything we do. That was in 2016, but the well-documented polarisation of society via social media has continued. However, the Cambridge Analytica scandal did have one good side effect. We've started thinking a lot more about the value and power of our own personal data and how we feel about organisations that abuse that power. Facebook is consistently in the news because of issues with fake news and um, the impact it's having on democracy and elections. Um, so I think it's now just really coming into the public consciousness in a different way when it was a bit more abstract. It's having a real impact on our lives. And the elections is a, a good example of this and people's understanding that there are issues with facts in the media that we consume every day. And interestingly, more awareness in the public around how technology and technology companies use data, which we haven't really been paying attention to collectively for the last decade. There is a balance. There is the great stuff we can do and the things that are obviously coming to press that have certainly caught, caught the limelight and caught people's focus of what we shouldn't be doing with these technologies. 
The power and innovations of AI and the way we use data are at the crux of the big ethical quandaries over the past few years. Firstly, because they're increasingly visible in our everyday lives. And secondly, because they have given us capabilities beyond our wildest dreams. Think about social media news feeds, online grocery shopping, ordering a takeaway via an app, blurring your background on a conference call, or picking what next to watch on Netflix. And all of these rely on AI and personal data in one way or another. I don't think we've ever been in a position as we are now to have real actionable insight that can make such a positive impact to our society. Data can make some real life-changing things. And the healthcare industry is a great example of that. And there's a, a hospital in Norway that has been working to reduce the mortality rates of high-risk operation in heart and liver. And the way they've done that is they've taken a very traditional 2D MRI scans. They've taken lots of data. They brought all of this data together. And then they've used other exciting emerging technology, such as augmented reality, to create 3D images of hearts and liver. And that has allowed them to, on really complicated operations, to use that data globally, get surgeons from around the world to collaborate and to figure out on how they operate on people. AI has the potential to transform our lives for the better. So why all these unintended consequences? Why do we so often get it wrong? I think it's easy to forget that humans create technology. They don't um, exist in a vacuum. They aren't created in a vacuum. And I think most technology tools that we use in everyday life, are they have been created with good intentions. But what ethics, digital ethics asks us to do is to take a harder look um, before we create technology about the potential negative consequences and then make sure that we're maintaining that focus on those potential impacts throughout the design, the creation, the implementation, the deployment and the ongoing management of it. Um, but it's not inherently good or bad. That's something that humans have to bring to it themselves. As we learned in the first episode on AI, things like bias and algorithms come from human error and the way that we code our programs. Even the autonomous cars are operating under parameters designed by humans. And herein lies the problem. Tech is fundamentally neutral, but new tech has unforeseen consequences and willful ignorance isn't going to cut it. We need to get better at seeing potential flaws, designing them out and protecting individuals. But how on earth do we do that? There are lots of examples out there of where we certainly need more control. And then we come on to the, the whole complex subject that is GDPR. How do we protect that data? GDPR goes some way to protect an individual, but we just can't rely on that alone. I think for me, and I look at grassroots, I look at right at home, we should really be educating, enabling people on how to protect them themselves, right at school or whether it's in the workplace or whether it's, it's in your, your home environment thoughtful regulation is a good thing. There's no problem with that. But if it, I guess it's incumbent upon industry to think about the things that we could do now to make regulation unnecessary. And I think we're at a crossroads as well. And we see where we want to push forward with technology and the exciting new opportunities that we have with technology. And then we have the legal ramifications and the legal issues around how to protect people's data. Are we taking a step back and actually thinking about the implications for that technology? Or as organizations or as countries, are we looking to see how quickly we can implement that fantastic new emerging technology without thinking about the long-term consequences? And, and I think that's a real challenge for us as a global community to think about how do we balance that pace of change 
with the thought around the implications to human life. There is no way to eliminate risk completely, of course, and things are going to go wrong. That's what happens. Um, life is complex and technology is especially complex. But I think what we're asking organizations to do and to think about is is actually just build in the corporate infrastructure and expertise to help you anticipate the potential consequences. I think really what's been missing quite simply in the past decade is that technology is often created, procured and implemented in a vacuum. It, it created often by people with a pure technology background who don't necessarily always think about history and humanities and, and social consequences. Jen says there's very little difference in terms of ethical responsibility, whether we're creating tech or procuring it. I also think that in the future, we're going to see more average organizations if not creating technologies, then using so much technology anyway that they will need to take a similar approach to those larger or technology creating organizations anyway. So eventually it is about equipping all of us in business, in public sector, but in society with a level of awareness around the ethics of technology and how to use data ethically. So for organizations that are creating their own technology, I think it is about making sure that they are establishing really, really robust digital ethics strategies and the expertise, both at the very technical and micro level, but also throughout the organization of digital ethics issues. And that's everything from data and privacy and transparency to also thinking about how technology is driving social issues like displacement and changing the world of work and, and skills in the organization and in society, issues of bias, fairness, equality and accessibility. Digital ethics needs to be at the heart of our organizations because quite simply, our use of tech is unavoidable and it has a massive impact on the world of work and society at large. As Jen alluded to, this is more than just designing tech for good. It's about how tech fits into the wider spectrum of ethical practice in our organisations. It's about who you are as an organisation and what you believe in. And I know just the guy to talk to. When I was a working class kid growing up, I was raised to believe I could do anything if I worked hard enough and I get into university and worked away. It's getting increasingly harder now. The levels of inequality in our society are alarming. And I don't know how long society thinks it can keep going with the vast majority of people with their faces pressed up against the glass, you know, wondering how they can get a slice of that life that you know, the others enjoy. That's not sustainable. It's morally wrong. And it's a sociological time bomb. This is Mick Jackson, the founder and chief executive of the Wild Hearts Group. The Wild Hearts Group is an organization that I founded with the purpose of using business as a force for good in the world, using the spirit of entrepreneurship and innovation to address head on the issues alarmingly increasing issues that the world faces. We launch companies and use the profits and the activities of those companies to further our social mission. Business has the talent, the resources, the reach, the influence, the networks, the innovation. It has everything that the world needs to address the issues that we face. And my passion through some of our corporate clients who are very significant is not only that they buy their business supplies and their business products and their document storage and their entrepreneurship training and all these services that we sell to fund the mission, but they reimagine their role, they reimagine their reach, and they reimagine the resources they have to make an impact in the world. The Wild Hearts Group has a plethora of wide-ranging social missions, from running the largest bank in Malawi for rural female micro-entrepreneurs to funding banking for the poor in Haiti. We manifest our spirit of empowerment through providing 
all kids uh, who want it with free world-class entrepreneurial education uh, through a program called Micro Tycoon, which has been a bit of a phenomenon. Over 50,000 people have taken part across 40 countries. It's taught at summer schools at Yale and Cambridge, and it's used by some of the world's top companies to train their graduates and their senior leaders. They pay for it, kids get it free. And in a further manifestation is in South Africa, we're now the largest producer and distributor of reusable sanitary pads. Now, from the outside looking in, you could see what on earth has banking got to do with entrepreneurship education, which has got to do with sanitary pads. They would appear to be a very eclectic portfolio, but the spirit running through is, what does that person need most to take agency in their life? I found out and I was horrified that a third of girls in South Africa, by way of example, drop out of school because they can't manage their periods. We developed a reusable sanitary pad, it's extremely well designed, really well made, um, can last for a year easily. And so for the price of a cup of coffee, provides the girl with a pad she needs to stay in school for a full year. But let me tell you the implications of not educating girls. It's so extreme that the United Nations said the closest thing we've got to a silver bullet in addressing the scourges that face the world's poor and the world in general is ensuring we educate girls. An educated girl will have an average of two kids, an uneducated girl has an average of eight the issue of population explosion. An uneducated girl is more likely to be a child bride. She's more likely to be trafficked. She's three times more likely to contract HIV. Her child has half the chance of surviving past five. It goes on and on and on. And all we had to do was give girls the same chance to get education as boys do. Really? And all it takes is a sanitary pad to do it? Oh, come on, man. Was that not obvious? Really? So when I see the, the so-called demigods of business pontificating of all the things they do, I'm like, you know something? There's a lot more you could do if you applied your mind to it. Business for Good is about reimagining your resources and role organisations play in the world around them. For the Wild Hearts group, tech can be wielded as a great level up, helping them to expand their programmes across borders. Our program, Microtaco, for 50,000 kids across over 30 countries have taken part. And we're, the challenge was, how do we scale this? How do we reach more kids? How do we help more kids? And the answer was tech. We have recently just launched an initiative for mental health and well-being as part of our school's program. In our first session, we were reaching hundreds of people through webinars, whereas in the past, our old way of thinking, we'd have thought people would have to go in person into schools. The way of democratizing access, the way of giving kids access to some of the most inspiring business leaders and some of the most cutting edge knowledge to inform them of how they can fulfill their potential and have a career of contribution can now be delivered remotely. So you can scale it exponentially. Now, there are significant issues in ensuring that all kids have got access to tech and all kids have got access to screen. But as a first step, our initiatives now, we are looking at how tech can reach the kids Ethical business and digital ethics can't be separated. It's about tech for good, but more crucially, it's about how organisations can be a force for good to address bias, inequality, fairness and accessibility. Now, it sounds like a tall order, but according to Mick, it doesn't take anything more than re-evaluating the resources that you already have. Our actual chairman of the World Hearts Foundation in Africa is the owner of uh document storage business that has contracts with the South African government amongst other large corporates. The vans for that organization called TTW, they crisscross South Africa. They pass some of the most remotest areas of the country because they have to fulfill their contracts. The genius was, we said, well, if the vans are crossing the savannah and passing these little schools where these little girls are dropping out, why don't we use the vans to deliver the sanitary pads? The infrastructure cost of that alone would be millions of dollars a year. All we did was reimagine what we were already doing. And that, and I, could you imagine if the geniuses in the tech company said, wait a minute, wait a minute. See this thing that we have that we walk past every day or we work on every day? Do you know it can be repurposed? And it's not that you're turning your back on your business. You're enhancing your business because what happens is your clients love it. Your current team's get so engaged with what the company stands for and the values of the leaders and the best talent wants to join you. So business for good is good for business and it's it's essential for the well-being of the planet and for humanity and it's also, I believe, essential for the well-being of the sustainability and relevance of 
corporates and brands. Mick has kind of hit the nail on the head there because digital technology is woven into our lives. Its ethics are inextricably fused to everything we do in our organisations. There's so much talk about disruption in the environment and disruption in tech and disruption in politics. I wrote an article about a subject we call compassionate disruption. And that is the attitudes and the demands that people now have towards business have changed so much that the executives who are not aware of it are literally not going to be relevant. They're going to be like the people chain smoking in their office. <laughs> you go, you do know you do know we don't do that anymore, don't you? And th things have moved on. That's how antiquated that will appear. However, this isn't burdensome legislation or some new thing that they have to do in the poor woman's working every hour, God sends anyway, running the business. This is an amazing thing to bring more of yourself. The more enlightened leader brings more of themselves to the table. They bring their values. They don't have to say, right, I care about my kids. It's keeping me awake at night that my daughter won't come out of her room and she's really struggling. But I switch that relevance off and I go to work because I can't think about it. What if you could address that? at work. And the wonderful revelation of that is, is you'll feel much, much better about what you do on a daily basis. Your team will be more engaged. They'll respect the leadership and want to be a part of that team more. And your customers and clients will respond to it. It actually enhances your core business if you get this right. But it has to be authentic and it has to be right for you. And it has to be within the space that you have a sphere of expertise and influence. And that's why it's so pertinent to tech because tech has the ability to address the fundamental problems that ironically some aspects of tech has caused. It's incredibly exciting. A digital ethics strategy isn't just a nice to have, it's crucial for staff retention, for engaging customers, and at the end of the day, for profit. Right back into 2015, I think this is the, the first one that I can remember that really made front page news for a long time. And that was when Talk Talk had 157,000 accounts to breach. And you look at the impact this has to organizations, it is long term. It has an absolute impact to the credibility of the organization and the image of the brand that it's portrayed to us as consumers. Data breaches and unethical practices impact an organisation's bottom line and trash their reputation. But getting it right can have a positive effect. Organisations that get ethics right outperform those that don't on almost all metrics. There are too many studies to name, but for example, there's one from Ethosphere, I think, that reported that companies with strong ethical credentials had higher rates of market capitalization by 14.4%. Then there's the employee engagement. Everyone wants to attract the right talent, the best talent, even in the face of this economic crisis. There's still a skills gap in organizations and being purpose-driven and ethical is proven to be a major differentiator in the, the employment market. Um, it can help identify new markets. It can engage your customers in different ways. Customers as well are now choosing ethical businesses more than unethical ones. And being able to show digital ethical credentials is really important to that customer engagement piece. The list goes on and on and on. So how can we get a slice of that sweet, sweet digital ethics pie? Well, it starts first and foremost with a culture of responsibility. Digital ethics should be pervasive throughout the organization. It's not about a single department. We need to build in the basic skills and understanding across organizations in digital ethics issues and then empower people to make the right decisions, raise the right questions when they don't think those decisions are being made maintain a, a culture of open dialogue and, and challenging because this is new and it is complex. Critical to any organization's progress is how do they evaluate emerging technology? It's about a balance for me. You've got to assess really quickly, can they make a difference to your organization? Can they make an impact to the market you're operating in? Are they an ethical fit? 
And I think you've got to really be able to move on quickly and dispense if you don't see a fit. Another thing that gets thrown around in the digital ethics world is thinking about what would happen if this technology appeared in an episode of Black Mirror, (laughs) which I think is um, cute, but also could be quite useful if you get people together to think about what is the worst thing that could happen and what is the best thing that can happen? And then how do you align this technology and those things to what your organization wants to achieve, including your culture and values? Digital ethics is a relatively new area of focus. There aren't many set methodologies or set frameworks that people can use, but there are lots of organizations that are defining standards, defining working practices, defining what policies could look like. And and there's lots of independent organizations that are really putting their their best foot forward in, into shaping some of these standards globally you know whether it's the AI for good foundation whether it is tech UK or whether it's the Ava Lovelace um, Institute Because digital ethics is such a new and expanding branch of ethics there aren't lots of frameworks in place for organizations to refer to so perhaps it's easier to ask well what does good actually look like? We have just been working with a fantastic organization, Harrow Council in North London. They came to us to look at how they could use citizen data in a more sophisticated way to drive better outcomes for citizens in their digital services. So they wanted to drive a better experience on their web portal, for example, and help citizens better find and access the services they were looking for. They wanted to use citizen data to help citizens find information that the council knows is relevant for that citizen, but the citizen might not have originally been seeking out. And eventually they want to do really, really interesting things like use predictive analytics to anticipate what a citizen might need. For example, if the citizen is in a vulnerable situation, could they actually provide positive interventions to help that citizen before the situation gets more serious? So really, really interesting project. And they were absolutely committed from the beginning to making sure that that they took an ethical approach to the entire project and indeed to all of the digital services within the council. So we helped them to create a digital ethics strategy, actually. We took them through a very collaborative journey of understanding exactly what it was that they wanted to achieve and why, what their culture and values were in their organization that would support or make it more difficult to embrace a digital ethics strategy. We talked to Harrow citizens about their expectations and views of digital technology, both generally and also specifically the council services. And we brought all of this together and co-created with them a digital ethics strategy and framework that helps them now um, understand exactly what they do do and what they don't do, because those are their ethical parameters. And then the strategy for implementing digital ethics across the council and the roadmap for doing that. And also critically, measuring success. So I think that's something that gets lost a lot because ethics is still a little bit seen as something that's doing some nice stuff around the edges. But if this is going to be embedded in organizations, we really need to make sure that we understand what outcomes we're expecting. Jen helps organizations to develop dynamic digital ethics strategies that are built to last. So I asked her for some top tips to kickstart digital ethics in any organization. Digital ethics should be a part of all decision-making because there's a huge amount of both potential risk and opportunity. And it's not just about the technology. This is about achieving organizational goals more broadly. It's not just what technology is going to achieve a single goal in isolation. So for example, automating a call center or something, but how that automation of the call center might lead to workforce displacement 
or might make services less accessible to certain users or customers and then the impact that those have on other organizational goals and that might be a commitment to social mobility or diversity and inclusion. This is not about what the IT department is doing or the creators of technology. This is about how digital supports wider corporate ambitions and then that should help you define your framework, what you do and what you don't do. I've touched on the importance of making sure you can measure success. So again, don't create a digital ethics policy that sits on a shelf somewhere and is never looked at or understand what it is you want to achieve through a digital ethics strategy and create the right objectives and KPIs and measure them over time. Make sure you've got the right expertise. As with any kind of strategic initiative, this needs to be steered from the top and empowered from the bottom. The implications of tech on our lives, on our organisations and on society at large are so wide ranging that it feels that we're just scratching the surface. The key takeaway here is that we think about those big questions and we discuss them as individuals and as organisations. If I'm going to recommend anything, I go back to actually Life 3.0. It was, it was actually the book that really got me really into all of this, that really understanding and focusing on what digital ethics really means for me as a person as well, and how I deal with digital ethics and what, what that means wider in terms of our society. It is about risk mitigation, but it's also about opportunity. So if you're not acting ethically and using digital ethics, then you're going to miss opportunities. You're going to not be thinking about the potential different and new users or customers you could bring on board if you did things differently or the trust that you could build with stakeholders differently and the differentiation you can bring to your brand through creating that trust and and acting ethically. The future, of course, is yet to be written, but what is clear is that digital ethics will be absolutely at the heart of everything we do. It has to be. Digital ethics absolutely is an innovation enabler. It's not just about putting the guardrails on and thinking about risk all the time. It's actually thinking about what could we achieve if we thought about technology differently. I'm an incredibly positive person. And for me, I truly believe this. If we have the right controls, we have the right policies, we have the right procedures, and that we deal at the top level of government, the top level of countries, the top level of organizations, we will absolutely do the right thing with artificial intelligence and data. We will continue to improve the way we live and work. We're hearing more and more about some of the alarming consequences of the misuse, if that's the right word, of tech be it from elections, right the way through to polarisation of society and mental health. I take great faith in the fact that the liberating effect of tech, the emancipating and levelling effect is, I think, far, far greater, exponentially greater than the negative. We just have to have that discussion and awareness, if you will. So with the digital ethics can of worms well and truly opened... Yep, sorry about that. We come to the close of the first series of Technology Untangled. A big thanks to today's guests, Dave Strong, Jen Rodvold and Mick Jackson. You can find more about today's episode in the show notes and be sure to hit subscribe in your podcast app to access all of our first series and to be the first to get new episodes when they drop. Today's episode was written and produced by Isabel Pollard and hosted by me, Michael Bird, with sound design and editing by Alex Bennett and production support from Harry Morton and Alex Podmore. Technology Untangled is a Lower Street production for Hewlett Packard Enterprise in the UK and Ireland. Thank you so much for tuning in and we'll see you next time.